Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, Senior Editor at Food & Wine, and this is a little bit of a different episode than we usually do. We're going to be hearing from a whole lot of the biggest names in food, chefs, restaurateurs, sommeliers, writers, um, people who are you might think of as having it all together as being people who really are at the top of their game um, in in food, in restaurants, in wine, in, in writing. Every single one of them has experienced failure. I mean, haven't we all as human beings? It's a thing we don't like to talk about so much. We're all on social media. We're out in the world somehow uh, touting our successes, and nobody really wants to get to the nitty gritty of, well, here's where I screwed up or had a setback or things didn't go my way or, you know, I really legitimately messed up and failed. The thing is, you can't really move forward in life in business, in uh, in your relationships, without stumbling sometimes and getting back up uh, and and moving forward and taking some lessons from what you what you learned um, when you when you stumbled and you fell. So I was lucky enough to sit down with a whole bunch of people um, at the Food & Wine Classic in Aspen and here in studio on the Communal Table podcast to ask some of these people about uh, their moments of failure, what they learned from it. And you're going to be hearing from some pretty uh, incredible people being pretty vulnerable. And uh, here we go. So could you tell me about a like a failure or a moment of doubt when you thought like, okay, maybe this is the end. Like there's, wow. you know, yeah. so, and, and then tell me how you recovered from it. Hmm. That's, uh, that's an interesting question. You know, I've... I tend to be, I don't know, maybe overconfident sometimes. So, so I don't know that I ever look at something and think this is the end or this is, um, you know, this is going to finish. I, I'm usually the other way where I'm like, we can totally do this. And, and I'd say almost to a fault where you're like, no, really, we shouldn't, you know, take that on or we should bring on more team or we should, you know. So sometimes I think my, my biggest challenge there is, is being too confident and and maybe even too masochistic and and saying you know we can do it and 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 then it's just too it's too hard sometimes you know rather than taking a step back and saying let's build a little more structure let's build a little more team let's really get ready for this um before we before we take it on um but but yeah i've I've never looked at something and felt like oh my gosh this is this is the end Uh, but probably i should have a failure, a setback, or a crisis of confidence that you had, where you th- maybe thought about, you know, either oh my gosh, I screwed that up, or maybe this isn't for me, and how you came back from that. Yes, <clears throat> so I was working at the French Laundry, uh, and uh, Thomas Keller and Laura Cunningham, really supportive bosses. Um, I was, I had flown, uh, I had gone down to, uh, I had flown to London to take my MS exam, and I had failed tasting for like the the I think it was the at that time the fourth time and so I was having a big struggle getting through the MS diploma and I came back and so many people so many of my peers are like oh you don't need the MS you know um, you're working for Thomas Keller you're the wine director for the French Laundry uh, you've gotten all these great accolades already and it was at the French Laundry where I realized well no I'm not doing the MS diploma for the pin I was doing it for my own self journey and it was just my wife Danette and just people around me who said hey just keep plugging away at it can you tell me about a moment of either well we'll just reframe this for me because I was saying failure but setbacks <laughs> or mm-hmm. or a moment when you were sort of having a, a crisis of, of faith or confidence and how you took that learned from it and and move forward from it Gosh, well, I probably spent the first year and a half or two of uh, Garland's existence in in that place, like every day. Um, I ended up opening a restaurant because we had a lease on this space. Um, We have a music venue upstairs and a bar downstairs, and that's sort of like where our comfort zone was. Um, But then this restaurant was in the middle floor, and it was, you know, pretty built out. It was ugly, but like there it was my my restaurant like oh my god okay I gotta learn how to do this and 
I knew how to cook for, you know, myself and maybe a dinner party for 30 very comfortably. Like, I'd always done that, catered some. But this was a huge challenge, and um, I was pretty, like, terrified. And I was um, very insecure about my ability to do it. And um, I had some, uh, my husband and I had some partners that also, like, didn't really believe in me. Mm. Um, Screw them. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, and I, I don't blame them in a way because I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. But um, right about six weeks after we opened, they said, like, this isn't going to work and you're really emotional about this restaurant and you really should give it up and we should lease the space because we wouldn't be, we would make more money. It would be more secure. And, you know, that was a huge setback for me. Yeah. And also in a way a blessing looking back on it because it challenged me so much. I was so hurt by it. I was devastated. Um, and I was really scared that they were right. Um, but you know, that kind of challenge really set me on fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it made me, uh, I, I took it as like a, a dare and, you know, we, we, um, parted ways in the, in the restaurant and then eventually in the whole, whole space. But, um, you know, there were some very quiet nights in our, in our first, uh, year and a half. And the cooks are just looking at me like, what am I doing here? And people would quit, you know, because they were like, it's not busy and I'm bored and like, I want to learn something and this is not my place. And, you know, there was just a lot, a lot of those kind of heartbreaks where you feel like, all right, I'm going to, here's my team that you always hear about the team. And then you lose somebody and it's very personal. So, I mean, I think the restaurant business is all about setbacks, but it's really more about bouncing back from those setbacks, you yeah. know? So we still have them every day, but it doesn't feel as terrifying yeah. usually. So we are asking people about moments of setbacks or failure or crisis of confidence that happen where you're thinking like, oh my gosh, maybe I screwed that up or, or maybe, you know, do I belong in this? How, have you had, can you talk about one of those in your career and how you came back from it? Um, I think we, I think we all have those moments of doubt, oh, yeah. right? I mean, I don't, I mean, you, you could be the most confident person in the world, but at some point you're gonna have a moment of doubt. And I've had so many moments, but ultimately what it boiled down to me was, well, if I don't do this, what else am I gonna do? Yeah. Like, it's no other choice, you know. Even when it's hard and it's like, you know, like even like something as simple as you know, re rehabbing from injuries. Yeah. Right. There's been times where I had to rehab from knee surgery and shoulder surgery, and it was the, at the time it was the hardest thing I ever did, and it was kind of like, well, what else am I gonna do? Am right. I gonna quit and never play basketball again because of the process is painful? So it's just you know you just gotta put one foot in front of the next, and you gotta you know get up out the bed every morning, and show up. Yeah. And if you show up, no matter what doubt you go through, no matter what you go through, you will be able to eventually, you will get through the storm. You will get to, you will find that sunshine. My life is all about failure. <laughs> <laughs> can you, um, can you share like a story in particular? Like if you can think of a dish or something like that, that you, you tried, it didn't work and how you came back from that or what you learned. Like, um, you know, there are, actually there are lots and lots of dishes. <laughs> And see, what happens is, like, and I always say that that you, a lot of, um, as chefs, what happens is when we make a dish, we are emotionally attached to it. Yeah. And if I give this dish to someone, for example, and the person eats, like, you come as a guest to mm -hmm. any of a restaurant, and I give this dish to you, eat it, and you say, mm -hmm. you didn't like it. The first reaction is that the person doesn't like me. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. That is a normal notion. People say, oh, why doesn't he like my dish and everything? But what I feel is that as an individual who's coming to my restaurant and paying money to eat something, he has all the rights in this world to say whether he liked the dish or not. So mm -hmm. it's not that you are saying you don't like me. You don't mm -hmm. like the dish. And the only few things we can do is I can tweak it. I, obviously, like, let's, let's give an example. If I make a dish and out of 100 people eating it, one person says that it's not good. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I, I can talk to him and say that, oh, maybe, you know, but if out of 100, say, 30 people or 40 people, 35 people say it's not good, it's not good, trust me. Right. <laughs> it is not good. There's something drastically yeah. wrong with it. And I have to either rework on the dish or think about it as a different concept and relaunch it in a different way. Yeah. So that's how I look at every dish. Tell me about some moment in your career of a, a failure, a setback, a, 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 like some sort of moment where you had a crisis of, of confidence. 
and in any of those situations, what happened and how you came back from that? Mm. Well, you know, I would say that I've been in business for 22 years now, and it's been constantly a, um, you know, uh, you know, move ahead a little bit, a little bit of a setback, move ahead a little bit, a little bit of a setback. Since I'm not a chef, um, I think that that has always been a challenge for me to um, be able to continue partnering with people and um, continuing to evolve the restaurant. And so, you know, whenever there is a chef change, it is always a challenge. But I think the, the biggest thing for me, you know, I was a, a one restaurant kind of gal for a really long time. And, um, you know, the, the concept of a group only really started coming together, I would say, in the last five to ten years. But my mother had a um, had a was diagnosed with leukemia, mm -hmm. and um, she ended up suffering when she went in the hospital for treatment with a massive stroke oh, that God. left her completely um, paralyzed on the right side, and um, she has severe aphasia. And I had been working, you know, like everybody else works in this industry, you know, from morning till night, and kind of you know wrapped up in my own little world of of taking care of people and um, suddenly my my world came to a screeching halt and um, you know really before I entered the restaurant industry I was in the healthcare industry before oh. I professionally entered the restaurant industry I was in the healthcare industry and you know the most important thing for everybody is their family and no matter what you know all any of my employees if they were in the same situation I would be like you have to go you have only you know one set of parents you you know, got to do what you have to do. So I did. And, um, you know, it was a really difficult time because I was just so used to being so hands-on and being the owner operator. Right. Um, that really changed my entire, you know, gestalt. <laughs> yeah. That, and what did you take from efforts? How is she now? Is she, did she? She's still hanging in there. Okay, and good. Pushing, but she's still paralyzed on the right yeah. and um, can't speak. Yeah. She understands, but she can't speak. Yeah. Can you talk about a moment that is a, a failure, a setback, a crisis of confidence that you had and how you came back from it? Oh, there have been many, many failures. Oh, here's one. This is real a uh, full circle situation. I was working after culinary school. I worked as a cook for a long time and then, uh, actually not that long a time, but some time. And then I went to work for Jeffrey Steingarten at Vogue magazine and I was an assistant for two years and then I needed to move on and find my next job. And I interviewed at so many places and one of them was at Martha Stewart Living. And they had a job opening for an assistant food editor and I thought this is my big break. This is gonna be my big opportunity. And Jeffrey put a good word in for me, and I had three grueling, nerve-wracking interviews with various food editors and editorial directors, and then they gave me a, a recipe writing test, and I wrote four recipes for them, and then they asked me to come in to the test kitchen and spend the day cooking in the test kitchen for them. And I mean, this was just for an assistant editor job and it was so grueling and so intense and I had put my heart and soul into it. And I spent that day cooking and I was totally intimidated by the food editor who was interviewing me and tasting my food and um, I didn't get the job. I was heartbroken. I cried for three days. I couldn't believe that I could have put so much energy into something and I didn't know what I was up against. I didn't know the person who got the job. I ended up actually knowing her years later and she did really well and it all worked out for us. Um, but I remember just feeling so deflated because there were, there, there, that was the end. You know, I, I failed. I had failed. I thought I was good and I felt like a phony and a fake and I failed. I couldn't get to where I wanted to go. And um, I still needed a job, so I kept looking and looking, and eventually uh, went to speak with Danielle Boulou, just so that he could kind of give me a pep talk. I'd come to know him a little bit through Jeffrey, and he was, um, you know, obviously an extraordinary chef who gave me some of his time, and I was so amazed that he gave me time. At the end of the talk, he was suggesting places I could go, things I could do, and I was still really hurting, really raw feeling from that Martha Stewart failure, and he said, you know what? 
I think you should just come work for me. It took a couple months to figure out how, but he was like, I'm growing, I have books due, I have restaurants opening, and my director of PR and marketing just can't do it all. And it was a sharp left turn from my path, right? My path was to be in food media, to be a food writer, and to be like an assistant food editor or something in a magazine. And I knew that this was a big departure. But I also knew that like when Danielle Ballou offers you a job, you just kind of say <laughs> yes and you take the job. And it really doesn't matter if you're scrubbing his floor because it's, you're going to get something out of it. And I did. And I worked for him for three years. And I, I like to say I got my MBA from Danielle Ballou. He taught me the business of restaurants. And three years into the job, Food & Wine came to me and offered me the job that started me with us. Um, and that was 15 years ago. And in the end, now Food and & Wine and Martha Stewart are owned by the same company <laughs> and here I am at the food and wine classic in Aspen as a speaker alongside Martha Stewart I'm not saying I am of the <laughs> ilk I'm just saying that things work out so can you tell me about a failure or a setback or a crisis of confidence that you had where you're thinking like oh maybe I really screwed that up mm. or maybe something and how you came back from that uh I mean after finishing the my job at the Jiangxi I was looking for like can be investor or someone can work with me as a partner but it's really tough to find out someone who understanding what am I want to do right. so I mean after like finishing my job at Jiangxi I was being like very confident about my things you know about the restaurant but you know the reality is not right <laughs> not that you know so even for me it's like i'm very new in the new york you know i just moved to new york about seven years ago oh. and then i've been working for jangshik about like three years so i mean i know some of the industry people but i'm not very known so well now you yeah. are <laughs> <laughs> so like at the time it's like really hard to find out you know investor right. like everything so i just like realize about myself more you know so more like deeply concerned about what I really want to do and so because the first time I want to open the fine dining first mm -hmm. the you know I've been through the fine dining thing so I just want to be more like kind of fancy or something like that but not too many people who want to invest in that kind of fine dining business even though I'm not very like popular so I just changed the mind so why don't you try something more fun and enjoyable things so the Sato Boys ideas comes out so <laughs> And the product that you make, it gets erased every night. Right. Every single right. day is a new thing. Well, <clears throat> the repetition of cooking is one of the things I love most about it. Yeah. Is, is the fact that we can go in there and try again, do it better, and get it to as close to where we love it as, as we can. And, you know, I steer away from other things, you know, like where people um, may say, hey, that was perfect, you know, or hey, that mm -hmm. was perfect taco and for me it's a taco these days you know what i mean like but for 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 me it's yes. just for me it's just like let's just try to do it better every day yeah let's try to please as many people as we can um let's let's be as creative as we can and let's have fun and and know that at the end of the day we can still start over again it becomes a little more empowering i think than it was at the end of the the day 10 years ago where it's like it's the end of the day you totally failed yeah. and that's what we used to look at it like it was a failure mm -hmm. you know like uh, to you know i was seeing a therapist for a long time he's like you should hear how you talk about yourself it's hard he, he used to say it sounds like you hate yourself yeah and it's you probably wouldn't say those things about or to anyone else. They no always say else. like, yeah, I, I think of the language I use no when I'm else. mad at myself. And I was like, I would never say that to somebody I care about or even somebody I didn't. Right. It's really, if nobody teaches you how <clears throat> to be kind to yourself, it's really hard to learn later. Um, I think in my case, it was it was later. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me about a, a moment of, Will Gadara just reframe this question for me, because I was asking people about moments of failure, but he liked setbacks, he said, of that or a crisis of confidence where you thought like, uh, you know, I, either I screwed this up or maybe this isn't for me. How, tell me about that moment and how you came back from that. Hmm, gosh. Um, I mean, the big one was, I think, when 
you know, I was working uh, at Husk. I think it was, there were, there were a lot of components, a lot of moving parts to that restaurant group. And um, I, I had to sort of step away after a couple of years and really reevaluate my intentions as a cook, you know, and where I wanted to find myself and how I wanted it to go forever. And so it took me a minute. I really did sort of leave feeling like I wasn't a great manager, like I... Um, had lost sort of a sense of ownership over re- research and development. Um, I don't know, like towards the end there, it started to feel a little bit like I wasn't good at my job, mm. you know, which is a really hard thing to, to come a- up against. And, um, you know, and when I could step back for far enough, which is what I did, I decided, you know, maybe I have been trying to make the restaurant industry work in my life for a long time as a mother of two kids, as a wife, as someone who really did need to strive for that work-life balance. And I think, you know, it was always one thing was going really well and the other thing was going kind of okay. I could never keep everything. I could never keep all the balls as high as I wanted up in the air. Yeah, <clears throat> what? that is you know? the, the condition <laughs> yeah. of working motherhood. It's right. Like if I wasn't, you know, if I if I was really highly invested in what my kids were doing, which I try to be all the time. You And you, I will note for the record, you are such a kick-ass mom. Oh, thanks. With some <laughs> incredible kids. My kids are the best things they that really have, are I've fantastic. ever seen. I mean, I, you know, there's a, no one quite like Maggie and Joseph Donovan in this world. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, that for me, I think was a, mo- a really pivotal moment of me trying to figure out if I could even work in the restaurant industry in, in that capacity or in any capacity. And I kind of felt like the answer was no for a minute. Um, and I stepped very far away and regrouped and it allowed me to sort of take apart what actually was problematic for me, I think, in um, what I saw as failure or what I saw as incompetence or what I saw as me not rising to the challenge well enough. Um, and and I got to sort of dive back in with uh, a little bit of a replenished spirit, which is something, you know, also I think I just was, you know, I was just exhausted, <laughs> you know, and I needed to kind of take a minute, you know, to catch my breath, not just from being a cook or, you know, running a kitchen or writing a menu or doing work that I love, but also, you know, again, like raising kids since I was 20, you know, and juggling it all and, and trying to make sense of things for a really long time. So, um, yeah, I don't see it as failure so much as I am glad that I, now, I did then, <laughs> but I'm glad that I could recognize, um, I'm glad that uh, I had the strength of character to know it was time to figure something out. Didn't quite know what, I just knew everything felt like it wasn't going the way it should go. <laughs> if you could tell me on the flip side about this, a, a moment when you ran into either a crisis of confidence or a failure of some sort and you questioned if this was for you or something just went very poorly, how you dealt with what that thing was how you, and how you came back from that. Um, this probably isn't going to be the answer that you want, but... It's also when I went to the LA Times and they basically brought me in to push the woman who had been the restaurant critic for 17 years Mm -hmm. out, an older woman. And I thought, you know, someday you are gonna be that older woman and somebody's gonna be pushing you out. This is really bad and I felt really terrible about it Um, and I never really got over that Um, the kind of ageism in America and being part of it and have you made did you ever make peace with her Um, she was very gracious and took her a long time to leave actually Mm -hmm. Um, and she was gracious about it um, but um, we were never really friends and mm-hmm. part of it was that what I did was very different and she was a very traditional restaurant critic and um, I wasn't so um, there was a lot of tension um, I think I look at failure in menu development a lot um, I kind of have um, the menu development in the restaurant is a collaborative 
Mm-hmm. It's not. A, so it's you. Who, who's it's in- me and my sous chefs. We have a meeting every week or every other week when, whenever we really can get it together. Um, and we talk about what we want to change and how we want to change it. And we taste food. And I look at failure in small increments and not like I'm going to die because this is totally you not get where I want then. it to be. <laughs> um, you know, so like dish development for me is kind of like small increments of little failures sometimes <laughs> it's never perfect you know like the first iteration that you do of something is hardly ever perfect but then you just work towards itch- etching away on what's missing what mm-hmm. needs to happen what needs to go away what needs to be added how do we make this better um so I guess I, I look at failure in, in that way and try mm-hmm. to remove it a little bit yeah so so something wouldn't so it's never really it's never a catastrophe that's yeah that's you what always the, have like a base maybe it's not the greatest start mm-hmm. but it's a start so if you just look forward at like making it better and being open to discussing how to do that mm-hmm. then you don't really have to feel like you're always failing you tell me about a, a failure or a moment of of doubt and you're like i i don't like you're like oh, I screwed up, or I don't know if I can continue with this, and how you pulled yourself out of that. Oh man, uh, it was definitely on uh, season ten of Top Chef. Oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a you know it was a significant moment of uh, when I went back to the finale and uh, did a cuisine that that wasn't true to my heart, I guess, um, and it just taught me a lesson to be yourself, you know, just just cook from the heart and. Uh, that's it. That's that's what I try to do. Just represent my family and and my my background. So, could you tell me about a failure or a sort of crisis in confidence in your career where you thought like, oh my gosh, this is the end, or I really screwed up, or maybe this isn't for me, and how you turn that around? Yes. Um, so when I started my company, the Indigo Road, I actually took over a failing restaurant. That was my first. Um, <laughs> We lost money for two years, so I really was like, what am I doing? And the change, and it is it is the mantle, the mantra at which I I changed the people. I got the right people to that that felt culturally felt like I did that 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 we had to first be hospitable to each other before we could be hospitable to our guests. Yeah, and it changed everything. Oh, I love that. Overnight, I changed the people and the restaurant got busy and now it's you know 15 <laughs> years old and and having a great life macintosh is pretty packed every time i yeah, go in yeah. there and so sit at the great. bar it's great so can you tell me about a moment of either failure or self-doubt or uh, just some sort of moment where you weren't sure you were either thinking like oh my god i really screwed that up or maybe this isn't for me and how you came out of that and what you learned from it you know Interestingly enough, when I opened Jardinier, which was my first restaurant that I owned, yeah. I was coming off of you know incredible accolades with Rubicon, um, Food and Wine Best, you know Top Chefs. I was uh, James Beard Rising Star Chef of the Year. You know, huge expectations around my own restaurant. And early on in the opening, you know, weeks, um, I started to get panic attacks before I would walk down for service because you know, I would I had this sort of ritual. I'd go up to my office, have a have an espresso, sit and kind of collect myself, and then go down to expedite, you know, during service. And I started having panic attacks. I mean, like had to like breathe in a paper bag, kind of like hyperventilating. Oh, I know panic attacks. <laughs> yeah. And so, but it was so weird because like. Everything, like, I, you know, I was trained, I was like, you know, like, it was like a racehorse, right? I mean, this was a, everything that I knew, like the back of my hand. There was no doubt, but I think it was just sort of this idea the restaurant was a lot bigger, and all eyes were on me with these huge expectations coming off of a very successful stint at Rubicon. And it just was something I had to work through. Um, you know, I had to really talk myself through that and say, you know how to do all of this, you know, and, and talk myself off the cliff, basically, to sort of reorient myself and be able to do the thing that, like I said, I know how to do like the back of my hand. Can you talk about a moment of either failure or a risk you were terrified to take and what you took from that and how you came out of it where something failed and you were like, okay, that thing didn't work out or where, you know, something super risky came up and, you know, you had to white knuckle it around and then how you resolved this. 
So it's funny. We were on. We we did a panel uh, yesterday. I'm sorry, I missed that. No, 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 no. It was amazing. It was it was fun. It was a great group of people. Um, and out of the panel, I don't remember how it came up, but we collectively identified the fact that we don't like the word failure. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think people live in constant fear of failing. Terror. Um, and that fear prevents people from actually taking the risks necessary to do anything of consequence. Um, and so just, I believe a lot in language and the importance of how you articulate things. And so we, we instead decided to call them setbacks. Oh, I like that. Because I've had plenty of setbacks, although, I mean, a failure, it just seems so... Uh, resolute or so right. irreversible or so mm-hmm. uh, you know what I mean yeah and so we've had plenty of setbacks we've gotten bad reviews we've had challenging financial times in the restaurants um, and honestly I, I think each one of those whether it's the competitiveness within you that makes you want to get up and push even harder mm-hmm. or fight even you know more to, to recover um, or just a general desire, if you're in the world of hospitality, to want to be loved. And when you read things or feel things, either from critics or the team or from guests you've served that, I don't know, show the opposite to right. be true. Can you tell me about a moment in your career where you were at a, a crossroads and realized you had to do something differently, think more creatively, take a risk, or something that you think of as a definitive moment in your career? Um, well, there are a lot, I'm old, so I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of career. Mm -hmm. Um, like something that, but no, I, no, I'm, I, I got one for you. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a a good story, but it has a happy ending somewhere. Um, (laughs) many decades later. Um, so I'm, it's, uh, 1980 I think it's a fall of 1980 um, I which should have been my first semester sophomore year but I've been kicked out of school asked to take a leave of absence mm-hmm. um, and you know I ran away to Europe and was cooking over there back in the days when you really could knock on the back door of a Michelin starred restaurant and stage there it's you just need a here. letter <laughs> for I mean you didn't, it wasn't the thing it is now yeah um, I think about 15 years ago, Thomas Keller told me at the French Laundry, they got 10,000 requests a year for internships and stagiaires, and they just stopped counting after that. I mean, it just, I mean, the world has changed. You know, Mm -hmm. this is, you know, 80. And I was, it took me two months to actually get to the point where they would allow me to put something on a plate. And they served, uh, they, there was an oyster preparation and Garmanger would shuck them, uh, plate them on this uh, tray uh, with uh, ice and it would slide over to another part of the kitchen where one or two were broiled, one or two were garnished, another two they did something else with and out the six oysters went. And <laughs> the the guys who were shucking oysters were not that great at it. And coming from, you know, a clam and oyster, you know, place, I was really good at opening clams and oysters. And so I was helping one of them, you know, cause I, I was like, whatever, snapping string beans or whatever, cleaning mm-hmm. zucchini. And I went over, by the way, this is a three-star Michelin restaurant in Paris. And I started opening oysters and one of the sous chefs immediately put me on oysters and mm. put someone else on cleaning the zucchini. And I mean, just because, I mean, you know, that, that's just the way it works. If you have a skill yeah. in, in a restaurant, that's, that is an appreciated thing. And <laughs> so and a couple of weeks later, it's a very busy night. And for those that don't know, a conventional oyster knife here in our country is either round tipped and dulled mm-hmm. Or it's got a pointed tip that's dulled and slightly curved or flat so that you can get into the hinge on the oyster. A French oyster knife is very short. It's much shorter. And it has a very, very pronounced pointy piece. And it's thin. 
And I'm I, terrified of where this is going. I still have the scar on my. I, I put the I put the oyster knife. There was no like safety glove. <laughs> you know, I had a towel in my hand, but it had gotten wet and it had you know slipped down. And I was hustling, and young, and not operating on a lot of sleep, and doing bad things at night after the restaurant. And I put the oyster knife through uh, through my hand, the the fleshy part between your thumb and forefinger, and I knew while there was no you know, stack of requests to stage there, there were people trying to get in there to work. And I knew the way the, the French world worked back then. If I left to go to the hospital, Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't have a job when I come back or may not have a job when I come back. And I listened to the voice in my head that told me I'm in garde manger. I looked up over the pastry section. There's brandy and vodka, you know, lots of different things i found a a neutral spirit i think they actually had vodka there poor brandy i poured it all over my hand i wrapped it in a clean towel and i just kept working and you know at 1 30 in the morning i showed up at the emergency room and you know they they put a little butterfly thing on one side and a stitch on you know single stitch on the other and i went back to work the next morning and (laughs) That was a defining moment for me because I bought in to what I had seen, what had been modeled before me, what was the standard practice there, which was tough it out. And that's what I did in, in lots of like stuff down the feelings. Don't tell someone what happened. I mean, all the things that we know today we're supposed to do the opposite of, you know, I just, you know, I just stuffed it all and went back to work Mm -hmm. and no one caught on the wiser and my hand got better. And I kept working there until I left and moved on to go down to Venice and cook a couple months later. It was, it was a, a watershed moment for me because I found a solution that I thought worked that would later turn on me and contribute that way of thinking would turn on me later and cause me cataclysmic problems in my life that required a lot of work to overcome and deal with. Thank you so much for listening to all these stories of failure. Uh, Maybe it makes you feel a little bit better about something that's happened in your life and your career. If it can happen to people who are as celebrated and successful as this, it's okay for the rest of us. And if you're intrigued by the notion of like, hey, do these conversations happen at the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen? Why, yes, they do. And you can buy your tickets. They just went on sale. It would be really great to see you there. Um, And you can mix and mingle with all of these incredible people uh, from the food world and beyond. I want to thank our producers, Jennifer Martnick, who was there on the ground with me in Aspen as we recorded these conversations that we had some long days there. And she was an absolute godsend. And here in New York, Margot Gotthelf and and Hallie Tarpley just do all of the behind the scenes work that keeps this going. And I'm so grateful to them. If you want to you know, always keep tabs on what we're doing here. If you like this conversation, if you like talking about <laughs> failure and, and the nitty gritty, boy, do we have a place for you to do that. It is Food and Wine Pro. Go to foodandwine.com, look for the pro tab, sign up for that newsletter that our editor in chief, Hunter Lewis, writes. I'll pinch hit for him every once in a while. And his stories about what is going on in the industry at this moment, some conversations that we have had with people. And we always have a mantra from Kelsey Young who works in our test kitchen. She is a certified meditation instructor and a deeply calming human. Let's get her on the podcast to share some of these mantras. She's pretty great. And then um, we, we've also got stories about what's happening in the business at the moment, how to take care of yourself through the long haul. Basically, it's communal table, the kind of stuff we talk about here in digital form. And I, please subscribe. Thank you so much to everybody who helps out with this podcast thank you to douglas wagner for our delightful uh for our delightful theme song it's jaunty is it not if you want to hear if if you want to hear more of of these kind of things you know what really helps is uh if we get to keep doing this thing and that happens if uh we're higher up in the algorithm 
And that happens when you leave stars and you leave comments and people can actually find us and we get to keep having conversations like this. And you know what? I think they matter. I hope you think this too. And if you think that there are people who you would love for us to be talking to or subjects that uh, you really want to hear addressed, we're not afraid of the tough conversations. And please find me. I'm easy to find on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip or just generally easy to find. Reach out. I want to hear from you. Most important thing you can do, though, is take good care of yourself until the next time. <laughs>